Hey there, Daniel from GrowYourMusicStudio.com and in this video, I wanna to talk to you about making marketing your studio feel easy. Now, we're about four to eight weeks away from the first signs of fall, the fall rush beginning. Uh, this is something that I experience in my studio. This is something a lot of music studio teachers and music school owners experience in their studios, that a few times a year, there is a swell of interest, a swell of requests, and it's good to capitalize on those things. And I'm anticipating that swell coming, and I wanna give you the tools to make your marketing feel easy. Now, I use that word very specifically because there is the actual skill acquisition and there's the actual feeling of doing things. And the idea for this video actually came to me as I was working with one of my advanced students lately we were working on a Chopin waltz and uh, the student was just remarking on how certain, uh, another song that they had played recently in the same book felt a lot easier. So this was an anthology, there was a Chopin waltz, and then there was another song in there that was, in terms of its difficulty or the perceived difficulty, the feeling of the song was a lot different. And we began talking about those differences and it led me to a story uh, it led me to tell that student a story of my experience in college working uh, on, on music. And um, I wouldn't tell the story if I didn't feel it was relevant. Uh, this, is direct, this, this idea that I'm getting ready to talk about here is so relevant to the topic of studio marketing that it just it surprised me that I hadn't thought about it before. So here's the story. Uh, my, uh, my freshman year, I was assigned a certain song to play for a... Um, department-wide performance class. So we were required to, to be in a performance class in the music department. And I'm not going to mention what the song was, but uh, it took me a good amount of time to get that song ready. I was working on it. I was just slaving away at it. And then my, my senior year, um, I was assigned to play Rachmaninoff's Prelude in G minor and was said, hey, play this for the performance class while concurrently getting ready for my senior recital. So I have this full workload of all these songs that I have to play for the, for the senior recital and I'm prepping that and, and polishing those pieces. And here comes one of the department chairs and says, yeah, you need to play this for the performance class. By the way, that's six weeks from now. And I got that thing ready. And what's really interesting is that that other song, uh, part of the reason I'm not mentioning it is I'm, I'm actually having trouble remembering which one it was because <laughs> of all the songs I played my freshman year. Anyway, that song my freshman year was not nearly as challenging as Rachmaninoff's Prelude in G minor, and yet it felt harder, and it took me longer. And this is the, this is the analogy I want to put in your head, that for me to play that Rachmaninoff Prelude, let's say that our skill at playing piano, our skill at making music, was great on a scale of 1 to 100, with zero being someone who's a brand new beginner and 100 being, you know, Rubenstein. Let's say that. If your skill level was at 100, your ability to play that Rachmaninoff prelude would be a lot, your, would, your ability would be a lot greater and it would feel easier to play that Rachmaninoff prelude if your skill level was at 100. Now, if you were to 75, you know, maybe it would take you longer. Maybe the polishing process would be a little bit more intense for you. If you were at 50, maybe it would take you six months, whereas at a 100, it would only take you a few days. Do you see what I'm getting at here? There is a skill number that we have as musicians uh, that even as we look at our students, if we gave a student who was in level five, if we gave them a level five piece, it might take them a couple weeks to learn it. But if we gave them a method book piece from the primer level, they would get it almost instantly. Now, here's where I wanna go with this. What is your skill number in marketing? And let's take the same analogy, zero to 100. Zero is I don't know anything about marketing, I don't know anything about persuasion, I don't know anything about communicating value to people. And 100 is I'm Steve Jobs and I can run Apple, or I'm Jeff Bezos and I can run Amazon. Do you see what I'm getting at here? So zero to 100, what's your skill level? What would be the skill level necessary to run a music studio at a basic level? What's that skill level? So let's just say for the sake of argument that uh, running a lemonade stand out in front of your house is a zero 
and running Amazon or Apple or one of these giant multinational corporations as a 100, okay? Where would running a music studio be somewhere on that scale? Let's just say for the sake of argument that it's a 15, okay? Let's just say that the minimum skill level to have a successful studio would be a 15. Here is the point. And, and this, is, this is where that analogy to the difficulty or ease in playing a piece of music can really, really help. If you're a 15, then running that music studio is going to feel like a challenge. Running that music school is going to feel like an uphill battle. But if you were to increase your skill level to, let's say, a 20 or a 25 or a 30, how much different would the feeling of doing the marketing and running the business of that studio feel for you? I dare say it would feel a lot different. It would actually feel a lot easier. Uh, this mechanism, um, this, you know, this number, uh, you could apply it to anything. I'm just applying it here to the idea of a studio. Now, here's the thing. What are the actual skills or actions you should take to increase your skill number? Because if, if you want your studio marketing to feel easy, your goal then shouldn't be to, oh, I need more students. Oh, I need to grow my income. Oh, I need to raise my rates. So I, it shouldn't be on those individual actions, even though pursuing those individual actions is a great thing. Your focus shouldn't actually necessarily be on those things. It should actually be in increasing your number. So how would you do that? Because, and here's the reason why, if you were to actually increase your number, those things would happen for you quite easily regardless. So let's say you're going to raise your rates or let's say you want to get a, a, a flood of students in in the fall. Okay, let's go with that one. Um, if you don't know that much about advertising or marketing, if you don't know that much about persuasion, if you don't know that much about how to follow up and get people to be excited, if you're running at a 15 skill level, then that's probably gonna feel quite difficult. But if you have educated yourself, if you have pursued more knowledge, if, you have pers if you've pursued greater skill than what is necessary, then it's going to feel very, very easy for you. So the way I want to end this video is actually talking to you about some of the things that I think studio owners should do to, it, to increase their skill, their business skill level, their business skill number. Okay, that's the first thing. And I want to tell you a couple things that I did that, that, that has assisted that has assisted me in, in, in the running of my studio and making that feel like just a completely stress-free, like I don't think about running my studio that much. I don't think about the marketing all that much. I wanna tell you what I've done to get to that place where the feeling is easy. Not saying it is easy. Playing Rachmaninoff's Prelude in G minor is not easy. And I'm kind of going back to the beginning of the video here. It's not easy. But if your piano skill level was like Rubenstein level, Evgeny Kassin level, Valentina Lasitza level, well, that's going to be a lot easier than if you're a student in their fifth year and you're trying to tackle Rock Mountain's Prelude. In the same way, it's going to feel a lot easier to market your studio if you've got those skill level numbers up. And again, this is just an arbitrary concept. I'm not saying there is an actual number. I'm just saying for the sake of this, for the sake of this mental exercise. So a couple things you can do. Obviously, I'm not going to dwell too long on, on the big ones. Um, the books you read, the podcasts you listen to. Right now, I will tell you that uh, one of my favorite marketing podcasts to listen to right now is a new podcast that came out this year by Seth Godin. It's called Akimbo. You can get it on iTunes Store, um, Stitcher, all the major Anchor, all the major podcast apps. You can go listen to that. Just listening to Seth Godin and reading his daily blog posts, you will change your perspective in a fundamental way and become a better business person and become a better marketer, period. In fact, you should just pick up Seth Godin's books and read them start to finish. They're brilliant. Another, uh, another thing, I did, I did a video back in December of last year talking about some of the books that have influenced me. I'm gonna go a little bit more high level than that. I will say that any book written by Steve Chandler is a book that should probably be picked up and, and read, it, or at least read one of his books. Um, some of the main ones I would recommend would be um, Nine Lies That Are Holding Your Business Back and The Truth That Can Set It Free, or his book Wealth Warrior, his book Time Warrior, or his, um, in my opinion, his best book, Reinventing Yourself, um, which isn't necessarily a business book, but it, it deals with mindset things that a lot of business owners struggle with. Um, I found that a lot of business owners, you know, it's easy to get trapped in this spiral of negativity as you're going about doing your, uh, building your business, as you're going about promoting your business. It's easy to get caught in that spiral. And I think that Steve Chandler does a really good job of addressing business concepts and talking about those things, but weaving it in with kind of that internal, uh, that internal thought. Um, now, getting a little bit deeper, some of the things that I've done, and what I would say is that 
I, at this point, and we're going to kind of end right after this. So, um, but some of the things that I have done, uh, and just to be quite honest, it feels very simple to run a studio now. Um, I spend probably less than an hour a month on marketing. Uh, if you don't count, you know, some of the intro lessons that I do, but in terms of reaching out to people and working on marketing, I spend less than an hour a month. Um, in a heavy month, it might be two. It's not a stressful experience. Most of the people that come into the studio sign up. Um, if they don't, it's usually because I've told them to wait or I don't want to work with them. Uh, most of the people that reach out to me follow up with me. And I know, you know, for some of you listening, um, I talk to a lot of studio owners from week to week. And that's, that's no lie. Like even in the last year, I've spoken to a hundred, at least a hundred separate music school owners or music studio owners. And there is a pervasive uh, problem that a lot of studio owners have that people reach out to them, they follow up, and then they never hear from that person again. What's going on there? Well, a lot of times what I found as I've dug deeper is that the things that you either said in the phone or that you sent in the email kind of turn people off to working with you. Um, you increase that business skill level number, you suddenly, that, that problem suddenly goes away. Now, I don't want to get too off track here. My point is, is that what I did in trying to get better at marketing my music studio was I went way overboard. And I can't tell you, I'm not going to stand here and pat myself on the back and tell you, oh, I'm a 50 or I'm a 100 or whatever. What I will say is that I did a lot more than what was necessary to run a studio successfully. Um, I even started and built businesses just to practice being better at business. <laughs> and I did it in areas that were far more competitive than the music studio space. I built an eBay store uh, that was, I'm not, you know, uh, out of politeness and polite society, we don't talk about money, right? Um, I'm not going to get into the, the specifics of, of the money that was made there. Um, but that eBay store was doing... Uh, in some months, four and five figures in revenue. Uh, and I built that in, in under six months. Um, I had a Shopify store at one point. At one point I was selling, uh, this was really early on when I, my, when I was kind of building my studio um, and didn't quite have the number I wanted yet. I learned sales in a direct sales company and then later took that skill and helped sell investment products. And again, this, is, this was early on. This was, wasn't when I was completely focused on the piano studio. Which, uh, and my point is, is that I went into some uh, businesses and into some business niches that were far more cutthroat than the music studio space and learned sales in those environments and bringing those skills back to music studio land. There just was no one doing that kind of stuff in music studio land um, and, 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 in, and in competition. Um, and then I think the thing that really changed, and if you've watched my videos or read my blog for any period of time, you know this to be true. This is the dead horse that I keep on beating. But really the game changer for me was combining that skill with learning digital marketing. And that is probably the other skill that most studio owners, if they were to invest in only that skill, if they were to invest a year of their life to understand that, just read books, take a course, uh, work with a coach, um, you know, like me or someone else, um, and just learn that skill, it would make you a better business person and it would make you far more, it would just deepen who you are. You know, I heard a piece of advice lately from, from a different source that said that, you know, this person outsourced their, their ads for their studio. And I think that's good. I think when you get to a certain size, that can be, that can be helpful. But it was also suggested that learning ads was just too hard for most people. I completely disagree. Um, I'm writing a case study right now of someone I worked with last summer, um, uh, a music studio owner in her late 50s that had never done digital advertising before and learned AdWords in less than a month. And, you know, I was supporting her. I was helping her along or whatever. And about five months later, she had tripled her studio size. And she did this on her own, she did. I did not build anything for her. I, I basically looked over the account when it was done. I helped her build it, um, but she's the one who learned it and did it. And what I would say is that you start investing in skills like that, it deepens who you are. It gives you perspective as to what is possible and it will actually change your business in that you're gonna see growth. And you know, you won't see it overnight. Never happens that way. In the same way that 
someone isn't going to come into my studio this week. I have a few students starting this week. They're not going to come to the studio this week and then play Rachmaninoff's Prelude in G minor next week. What I will tell you is that learning some of these skills, persuasion, sales, they don't take nearly as long as most people think. And that you can make a substantive and huge difference by investing in these skills on your own. So with a, a final thought here, there are no secrets in marketing. Um, there are no secrets in business. I'm not here to tell you like what the secret is. I've been very open about what made my studio work and how I help other studio, make other studios work. What I will say is if there is a secret, it's just the hard work. You just have to do the work. And you invest your time, your effort, your energy, your money into building those skills. You grow that studio, you, know, you grow that business skill number to a higher level, all of a sudden, it begins to feel a lot easier and you're not constantly thinking about where's my next student coming from? You're not waiting by the phone, waiting for that next student to come in. You're not just solely relying on word of mouth. You're actually going out into the world, acting on the world and the world is responding to you. And that's a really empowering and great place to be. So anyway, thanks for watching this video. Uh, if you have any questions, I'd love for you to type them in the comments below. I'm, I'm going to definitely follow up on these comments throughout the week. Um, I'm going to come back uh, later this week. I think on Wednesday or Thursday, I've got another video that I'm going to be doing on, um, on uh, when you shouldn't do AdWords, which is interesting because I've never made a video about that before. Usually I'm just like rah, 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 uh, go do ads. I'm gonna tell you some situations in which that shouldn't be the case. Or I might do that video next week and do another video on Thursday if it strikes me. It just depends on the mood for the day. But a lot of times I do these videos off the cuff and uh, love to interact with all of you all. So uh, definitely smash that like button, share this um, on a group or, or send it to someone who you think it could use it. But thanks so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Talk to you soon. Bye.